Hi, I'm Miriam and this is Trials and Errors and welcome to part two of our Ken White Pope Hat interview. In this episode, Ken and I get a little more personal. We talk about mental health in the legal profession and the stigma attached to mental health diagnoses. We talk about his family, his children, racism, the injustices in the criminal justice system and fair sentencing. While we're talking about depression and mental health, you were one of the people that I spoke with a couple of years ago when I was really, really, really struggling. And I, I mean, every now and then I just DM you and tell you how much I, I appreciate it um, for you being there at that time. You wrote, and I, I'm going to try to do this. You wrote one, it's a really long post too, about going into a psychiatric facility. Uh-huh. And this was in 2015 that you wrote it. Right. right? It was um, a year after the incident. Right. 2014. And, you know, you don't go into, um, you know, kind of details about what, what brought you there. And we don't have to talk about that um, if you don't want to, but how, why, why did you write this? What, what made you? Well, you know, in 2014, I'd had, you know, I've been, I've been unsuccessfully battling depression and anxiety for a long time. Um, at least since 99 and, you know, I had medications, I'd had talk therapy. Sometimes it was better. Sometimes it was worse. That's the thing that people, you know, who deal with depression and anxiety, you know, it goes in waves and there's seasons of it. Uh, it's better or worse any given time. Um, and I just hit a really, really, really bad, as bad as it possibly could be crisis point. Thanks be to God. I had support and, I went in and I had everyone in my life was had my back and gave me what I needed to get treatment and take have a real serious plan um, uh, to how to address it and reevaluating everything from you know that was really the first time I think really confronted that there was an anxiety component to what had been diagnosed as just major depression, which makes a big difference. Uh, it, was a, it was a more serious evaluation of what meds were appropriate and why, and including meds addressed to anxiety. You know, my initial, the initial time when I got uh, treated, uh, I was with the government and I was on an HMO. Can you bleep things on this show? I can. We edit so, them. HMOs. All right. So, uh, you know, I'm watching someone go through the same thing now. I got terrible advice and support for major depression and anxiety through an HMO. And, you know, that made 10 years of my life a lot worse than it otherwise would have been. And I had the money to get really good treatment. And it's terrible that a lot of people don't, but that made a difference. I realized as the year was coming up, I was reflecting and I realized um, how I still had stress and still sometimes had symptoms of depression and anxiety, but how often close to normal I was and how amazing normality is if you've been depressed and anxious. You know, it's like a drink of ice water when you've been in the desert. And uh, I thought about how important it was that people supported me and how important it was that I made some decisions about what to do. And sort of methodically how to go about getting better. Um, and that just doesn't happen without effort. And I thought, you know, people ask me, what did you do? People ask me, how can I get better? And people ask me, what can I do for these people I love who are suffering from this? And I thought, kind of weighed on me, I, I should I should talk about it. One of the reasons I talk about it is that this, there remains this real stigma uh, to it, as ridiculous as that is. You know, uh, talking about how you have depression and anxiety, let alone so severe that I went into a mental facility for it voluntarily, although they said, you know, would you like to volunteer or would you like us to commit you? When you get to that level, there's real stigma and people worry. People don't get treated because they think that they won't be who they are anymore if they do that. People think if I go into, you know, if I go into the loony bin, I'm never again, I'm not going to be a doctor. I'm not going to be, you know, a teacher. I'm not going to be a lawyer. I'm going to be this other thing. No one will ever take me seriously again. No one will respect me. No one will trust me. And it's just not true. People don't recognize that the the threat to you doing your job and living your life is, of being untreated is far greater than the threat of being treated, even in these ways that scare you. What I wanted to do was tell a story about what it was like and what worked and why and how 
why, you know, what worked for me may not work for everyone, but the the point of it is to be open to the different methods. Well, we want to talk, I want to, I want to go back to what you said during that, you know, I won't be a lawyer anymore. And you know that a lot of bar applications do in fact ask about mental health history. Yeah. Um, and can you, how does that, I mean, I know for me that would impact getting mental health treatment because if you're not treated, there's nothing for you to write down, right? If you don't have a diagnosis. Right. And that's absolutely perverse. I, I have to confess, I'm not as familiar with this because, you know, I was admitted in 94 before I really started suffering from overt depression, although the, the seeds were all there. I never had to confront this. I don't really know very much how it works these days. Um, and I do think it's pretty appalling if bars are basically incentivizing being untreated because the the, mo the absolutely worst thing you could do to protect clients is to incentivize law lawyers to be untreated because that's how the ball gets dropped. That's how clients get screwed, you know, by clients who are in crisis, excuse me, by lawyers who are in crisis. So if the bar, if the bar wanted to do something, it would say, we need you to know, we need to know that if you have an issue that you're addressing it and that you're addressing it in a, in a rigorous way and, and keep addressing it. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know that that's their attitude all the time. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think it is. <laughs> I mean, right. in Virginia, um, I'm, I, I live in Virginia, but I haven't, I'm not admitted to the bar in Virginia and mm -hmm. it is a question that they ask you, but they ask you if it's affected your practice, if it's affected the practice of law. Um, and that's, you know, like you said, it's one of those things when it, when you are in a, in a situation where you have, the, when the depression is on you, right? You always have right. it, manage it, but when it's on you, of course it affects how you practice law. And then maybe you, you know, let other people handle things. So I kind of stopped the bar application until I can, you know, thoroughly digest what you should put, put on. I'm not the one to give that advice because I haven't dealt with that issue. I've only dealt with the consequence of being someone who got admitted and then had issues. Uh, but I, I can't imagine that it's a good idea for bars to, you know, encourage people to lie or encourage people to minimize the severity of their problem. There are tons of lawyers out there who are successfully treated for all sorts of things, everything from alcoholism and drug addiction to severe mental health issues. And when they're successfully treated in a regimen, then they're able to function. Uh, so the question isn't, you know, whether some have an issue. The question is, is it an issue they're confronting and, and treating? And you didn't have, I mean, you didn't have any issues with the bar, with clients during this time period, or how did you handle all of that at that time period? I had I, my coworkers and colleagues stepped up and backed me up and took care of what had to be taken care of. And I got extensions and delays of things when I needed it. And um, a lot of the time, the effect, you know, people react as you know, to depression and anxiety in different ways. So I don't tend to have the reaction where you can't get out of bed, which obviously could be a problem with client services. I, I have the reaction where I do it is just indescribably miserable uh, as I'm doing it. You know, and if it keeps getting miserable, then sooner or later it's unsustainable, and then that's when you go into crisis. So I think the key is to have those people, right? To have right. your your family, your coworkers, and say you know, um, I need your support on this. And part of it for me was to make an agreement to be real upfront with my closest colleagues uh, and my family and say, look, uh, you know, I went through this crisis, you're worried, so here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna be able to ask me any time how I'm doing and I'm gonna give you a number from one to 10. You know, 10 being writing, I'm writing with golf pencils uh, in an insane <laughs> asylum in your, and, and, and one, throat. yeah. And, and one being um, that uh, everything's hunky dory, and so right. I say, okay, today's a three. Okay, what can we do? Well, if you could help me by talking out this issue in this case and see if I'm just being paranoid about it or whatever, being that upfront, and honest with people you can trust, and them having your back is key. Well, so the t the takeaway that I'm getting then is just to take care of what you need to take care of, and don't wait until you are just kind of build up the support system right. so that you're not, it's not when you're in crisis that you ask people for help, ask them before you get to that point. 
And you have to be honest and open with somebody. Obviously, you don't have to say, Judge, I don't want to answer that because, you know, uh, I'm clinically depressed. Uh, But you do need to be open with your coworkers and your family, your support system. So the problem I had, and a lot of people in our profession and similar professions have, is I'm really, really good at masking. So Mm -hmm. the people around me really did not know how you know, unutterably miserable I was, uh, most of the time. Uh, and so because of that, they can't tell a crisis is coming until it happens. So you've got to, you've got to basically say to people, I need help. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's a very hard discussion to have, but it's absolutely essential. You, You can't mask and conceal what's going on. No, it's too important. I mean, and, you know, you're too important, right? And people think that you're important, even if you don't think it at the time. Yeah, and that's the problem, right? You think no one would give a shit if I live or die. And because that's the way depression lies to you. And Mm -hmm. in fact, all sorts of people really want to help. In fact, they're, as soon as it happens, they're, you know, half the communications I get when I write about this stuff, and I get a lot, half of them are about, you know, my wife or my brother or my best friend or my son. Does, how can I help them? How can I help them through this? What can I do because they're going through this? So there are people there who want to help. Yeah, we just have to let them, right? Exactly. Yeah, but the depression sometimes does it gets in the way of all of that. And it what's does. when the people when people around you know, right, and they know what to look for, so you don't actually sometimes don't even have to say it. They're just like, right, you're on the couch all the time, and you're really, I mean, you know, you haven't showered in a few days. Something's going on here. Yeah, my dad will like call me and say, "You haven't tweeted much recently. Are you doing okay?" <laughs> so, which just shows how well he understands me. Exactly, exactly. You know when right. they, and that, but that has to come from you saying like, "This is what this is what happens." Right? When you right. saw me on the couch for three weeks, it was because I was depressed, not just because Crazy Ex Girlfriend is such an amazing show. I just couldn't right. stop watching. You're exactly right because you have to tell them and you have to be open. My wife's a, a very talented clinical psychologist and she didn't spot really? where I was. That's because, of course, I spent 22 years of marriage dissembling from a very talented uh, clinical psychologist to have uh, a zone of privacy. But uh, you've got to be upfront with those people and help them see when there's a problem. Ask him if he's read the book about Brock Turner trial and the Persky recall that just came out. I guess there was a book about Brock Turner's. I have I have not um, read it, although I know obviously the case and and uh, am interested in it. For for any of your viewers who aren't super familiar with it, I don't know if you've done a show on it or anything. Not you yet. know, Bro- Brock Turner was this young, you know, douchey Stanford swimmer who uh, raped a a fellow student. And, you know, the defense was, oh, they were both drunk. The fact that, you know, he did this in the dirt next to a dumpster outside a frat party doesn't mean it wasn't consensual. You know, every every sort of trope and thing that you hear about in rape cases. And the judge gave him an extremely lenient sentence. Uh, And the judge wound up being recalled for that extremely lenient sentence. And um, my, my take on it is sort of torn and conflicted. Uh, on the one hand, I found the sentence for what he did disturbingly light. Um, and I thought that likely this was a f- reflection of the type of people who get mercy is people who remind the judges of themselves. So it's another, you know, the, the, the judge is a a uh, judge from an elite college who was an athlete. You know, the kid is an elite college, an athlete. And uh, I thought for what he did, which was really despicable, uh, that, that that was a disturbingly light sentence. On the other hand, I know that when this sort of thing happens, really who winds up suffering are mostly poor, mostly brown and black people. Because, you know, this judge is someone who used to show mercy and compassion and not be a hard charging, whatever the DA wants, sentencer. Uh, for the vast majority of defendants in front of him who weren't, you know, didn't have a Stanford uh, education and were elite swimmers with wealthy families. When this sort of thing happens, I think that it's uh, usually it just turns up the ratchet on the criminal justice system that we only go in one direction, and that's longer sentences, 
harsher, a mindset where we're more afraid that someone gets off too light than we are afraid that we sentence someone too harshly. And whenever there's a big to do like this, that happens. And I, and I think it's, it's tragic. Uh, I, I wouldn't, I don't think have sentenced him that lightly. I think that the reaction to it kind of shows how outrage can be used uh, to do more social evil than good. So what's the answer though, Ken? I mean, we don't want black and brown and, and poor people to get longer sentences. Right. But they continue to get longer sentences. And there seems to be very little we can do to not have them get longer sentences. What what do people do then? You know, we're in a system of humans, including human judges, so we're never going to get it completely right. I think that appellate review of sentences leniency can have a serious effect. And I think you've seen that sometimes. I think the feds do it better than most of the states right. because of the standards of review. Um, you know, the federal system to me, I don't see something where kind of lenient, but still within the ballpark sentences are getting overturned on appeal. I think it's only really out of bounds, extreme leniency that tends to get overturned on appeal in the federal system. And I think if California's state appellate standards for, uh, the, uh, how sentences are reviewed, were crafted right, you could have some limit on this type of thing. But again, we're dealing with humans who so say the system is going to be imperfect and you're going to have outliers like this. You know, we don't want someone who got a lenient sentence to get a longer sentence either, do we? Well, I think, I think it depends on how lenient. I think you could argue that it's okay that maybe some sentences are genuinely unjustly lenient. And I, I think those are going to be ones where real people are victims are seriously harmed in a way that has not been redressed. And it seems as if are not have not been taken seriously, which is kind of my, the sense I got out of this. This guy's family was out doing tours about the dangers of alcohol and premarital sex, which to me does not reflect a, a recognition of what went wrong here. What went wrong is, is that their little darling forcibly raped somebody. So uh, I could see a system where the appellate court has some more power uh, on some sentences, but otherwise I would, I would be very worried that it would be sort of anything that's below what the prosecutor asks for. You see this a lot and you see it uh, in a parallel way when judges, particularly in the state system, on the incredibly rare occasions when they suppress evidence or grant a motion in the defendant's favor to dismiss a case or something like that. There's this huge overcorrection. The DAs go to the press and say, we're never going to allow any case to appear in front of that judge again. We're papering them so we don't have to move there. Uh, you know, they get the unions involved. The police union, the DA union is going to contribute to get this person thrown out at the next election. And all the other judges fall in line. And that's the last time that year you hear anyone granting a motion to suppress a search. There aren't easy answers. Uh, I guess my contribution to, to the discussion, other than saying there aren't easy answers, is that there's a moral weight to outrage. And the moral consequences may not be just the good ones that you want. I mean, like, seems like one of the consequences of this was that a judge who gave I think a dubious sentence that is subject to serious criticism got recalled and really expelled from a lot of social circles. A judge who had said some things that I think were somewhat regrettable, particularly when taken out of context about the situation. The not so great consequences are probably the other judges are going to be that much more prone to giving higher sentences rather than lower sentences, that much less prone to giving breaks, to taking chances. And I think for the most part, it's not the Brock Turners of the world who are going to suffer. So what do we do? What do we do with our outrage? Uh, I guess try to tailor it a little more, make it more um, tightly focused, uh, more informed. Uh, and you know, a lot of outrage is very uninformed. So you know, a good example of that being outrage over uh, bail conditions of capital rioters. People have never been to a goddamn bail hearing, think that they're like, uh, you know, experts on federal bail and this must be a Trump judge overturning the law, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, 
I don't think the human inclination is to season our outrage with knowledge, but uh, maybe it couldn't hurt. That's what we had the, my videos for. I did a whole one on federal bail. That's great. You know? Yeah, I, you know, and, and I, I, I agree with you. I think that the problem really is, and I, I know even as somebody who has the knowledge, right? Right. I feel outrage. There are times where I'm just like, sure, because judges no, get, you know, get you have to pull yourself back and remember who's really going to be hurt. Right. By my just emotional, feel, my my emotions over this, and, and I mean, I, I think sometimes it's not just emotional. I think the very rational, informed critique of it uh, can provoke outrage. And I think there are arguably a couple of those where magistrates have made calls that I think are, oh wow, really? I I, I don't see that call. I don't see this person as being adequately supervised in a way that prevents a danger to the community. But I actually think federal bail in this respect, uh, in terms of limited respect of overturning overly lenient bail is a success story in the sense that the appellate system for it works pretty quickly and pretty well. So it's fairly rare I see a genuinely outrageous lenient bail decision that doesn't get somehow modified or overturned. Of course, you know, the problem with the federal bail system is that it's good that it says that you get out unless there's no combination of conditions that will assure you're not a danger or that um, you won't fly. The problem is the sort of conditions that tend to do that are the, the sort of conditions accessible to affluent people. And uh, it's the poor black and brown people who lack the access to those conditions that can keep them out of jail. So that's the structural problem. What about um, that Jake Agnelli Q shaman getting his organic diet? I'm, honestly, I find it hard to get outraged about simply because prison conditions are, are so uniformly horrific that if they're sometimes going to have to do something, I mean, I wish they would spend less focus on him getting an organic diet, more, more focus on people not being, you know, uh, uh, murdered in prison or, or uh, deprived of food and water to death or ignored for medical care or right. what's his face who With the amount of COVID we have in our, in our DC and Maryland. Jails. Yeah, exactly. So again, I, I think that's one where it's an outlier and cheap outrage of it is going to make it easier for prisons not to do minimal things they should do for prisoner welfare, which is a bad outcome. I think you're right. I mean, I was surprised that they actually uh, detained him. I didn't. I didn't think they would. I did a, you know, I did a live stream, and I said, I, I think that if we look at, at the Bail Reform Act, I mean, he has no prior contacts with the criminal justice system. You know, he, he came to court. It's I, amazing I what you can get away with if you get to go to court. You know, if if, if you show up. Well, that's why I couldn't. I don't. I couldn't understand it. And then some other guys who were clearly a, a lot more dangerous in right. these other jurisdictions were getting released. But then they came here to DC and they all got detained. My perception of it is a lot of the difference sometime is the very human asshole rule, right? If you're just a smirking dick, you're going to get detained. Right. So if you're the dude, you're feet up on Nancy Pelosi's desk smirking, you're going to get detained. Because there's no combination of conditions that's going to convince the judge you're not just a dick, and but so he got released, right? Originally, I th I think, uh, yeah, but then he got detained, I believe. Right. And, well, he was because he came to D.C. and right. the D.C. judges were like, I think that was in Arkansas. That guy was from Arkansas. Right. The Arkansas judge let him go, and then yeah, so I, mean, the, the judges, I mean, they're just like. Know, the clients are their own worst enemies, and the way they act, they talk themselves into bad outcomes. Uh, and you know, a lot of the time people get, it's amazing what they can get by being polite and respectful. So like, you know, I had a guy who was facing 20 years mandatory minimum drug sentence. Uh, there's a, a presumption that he's a flight risk and a danger, but when he hears there's an arrest warrant, he shows up to the marshals in, uh, Nevada and they're saying, holy shit, you're just showing up. Yeah. Well, let's take you to court. And they say, well, you have to appear in Los Angeles. He's okay. okay, well, well, I'm going to trust you because you showed up here. Yeah. And then he showed up in Los Angeles. And the judge is like, wow, you just show, you didn't flee? Uh, okay, well, I'm putting you on bail. Because, you know, he was polite, right. respectful. Yeah. He showed up and he did the things he was supposed to do. And all of a sudden, you know, so. 
What's when they have the courtesy of uh, being told, right? So that, and a lot of times if they have a lawyer in advance, it's really helpful. Yeah. You know, you can be like, hey, my client's ready to turn himself in whenever, you know. Right. We love you guys. I'd love to know how you both found the strength to be so candid, given that you have such a wide and critical audience. It's an incredibly diverse audience uh, from friends to frenemies to uh, critics to nasty trolls and things like that. But I decided a long time ago, survived extreme uh, uh, clinical depression and some dude with an anime avatar who lives on his mom's futon in the basement uh, is really not going to move the needle on my human misery much. Uh, I, I pretty much just make fun of them and move on. Um, when somebody asks, this is a kind of a good question. What is one belief about free speech that you once held but no longer hold? That is a very good question. Some people sort of do this thing where, you know, all our speech comes together. It's part of the big symphony of American discourse. And so it all has value put together and ours is not to judge the value. It's sort of a non-judgmental approach to free speech that I bought into a little bit. Whereas now, even as I'm that much stronger of a free speech defender and a policer of the line of where, where, free, speech, where free speech is and where it should be, I am much more judgmental and critical of speech. And I think it's a necessary component. So I'm not the one, you know, people say, why can't you just defend the speech without criticizing it? Why can't you just say, no, that speech is protected by the First Amendment without adding, and that guy's an asshole. It was to me because that guy's an asshole is an essential part of the discourse. Um, so I think that as you protect more objectionable speech, uh, that we should be more vocal, more vigorous about calling out the objectionable speech. So, and I think that what, what's been happening a lot is that, do you, do you think that people who object to things, for example, Donald Trump being banned, from Twitter and Facebook and saying, you know, these are free speech rights. Are they getting it, right? Are they understanding it? Or, or do they mean it in that same way? Do they mean it in the way of like all speech is part of the, you know, it's a grand old flag. It's a, you know what I mean? Like it's very like kumbaya, but bad. I think I think they mean it in a free speech culture sense. And free speech culture is usually code for speech I like is promoted and speech that makes me feel uncomfortable for talking is, is disfavored. So I, I think they think that everyone should work together in a free speech culture to make sure everyone talks and everyone is heard. But I mean, that's, that's not a philosophically coherent viewpoint because it devalues my free speech and free association rights when I don't want to, you know, I, I, I don't want to sit still for someone trash talking me. I don't want to inv invite someone in my living room to scream at me. And if I run a company, if I put a whole lot of work into uh, a website, I don't want it to be overrun by bigots. Uh, because that then I would no longer feel like I was running the website that expressed what I wanted to express. What do you so, think as a, as a nation or as a society or as a culture? I mean, just throw everything against the wall and see what sticks and what falls off. And I mean, where are we going to end well, up? We with do, that? but we do. But but a website or uh, you know is not a nation. The website is a group of people who decided to do something together uh, to make money and to express themselves. And when you tell them, "Sorry, but uh, you got to let in ranting racist Don uh, into your." you know, uh, into your expression, then suddenly they don't really have full free expression expression rights. I, on my blog, if I still ever wrote for it, had to allow the commenters who are threatening me or calling me names or using racial slurs against my children or something like that, then I don't feel I'm really free uh, to exercise freedom of association or the freedom of speech to present the site that I want to present. I always find it very odd that people talk about your children your children are adopted right yes um, um, my, my older two we adopted from uh, korea and my youngest from china do i mean do they know when they're you're being attacked through them i mean do you i mean do you guys have this discussion do you 
do they know? I mean, how do they, how does it affect you as a family? Uh, I don't bring, I don't bring it to their attention. And um, they frankly are completely uninterested with all my social media channels, which they find to be lame and tedious and embarrassing. Uh, they get really mad when they do something and I start tweeting. They say, you're tweeting about us, aren't you? Uh, and um, so they don't catch a lot of it. You know, they have to deal with racism in their own world, uh, in their own ways and face those challenges. But most of the, uh, you know, they don't follow me on Twitter, thank God. And so they don't see that stuff. Do you think that being the parent of children from another country and another culture, um, and I don't know, did you adopt them very young? Yes, uh, it was five, four months, five months, and 10 months. Right, but do you find, do you think that maybe that has um, influenced how you've come to view the world? No question that it it personalizes racism. I'm still obviously a step removed, but it personalizes racism and makes me see things I think that I, I would not otherwise see or really recognize. Um, it makes me angry on their behalf uh, a lot of the time in a way that I should be you know, angry on the behalf of all my fellow humans, but it's much more personal. It's someone very specific that you love. I, I do think it, it ha for many people, it might be a friend or something who's a member of some group, but all of a sudden when they hear a slur, it's not just funny in the abstract. It's just their friend that's being talked about. I really think that exposure to people makes a big difference in whether or not um, people tolerate, uh, you know, that bigoted talk. So as a, as a white man, mm -hmm. like, what do you, do you feel like it's your responsibility to talk to your other co-white men, co-white people, educate them, make them see the error of their ways as well? Because I can tell you, the rest of us are tired. We want you of to course. collect your people. Sure. Come get your boy. Uh, but, but so. you know, come get him because, I'm, I mean, I can tell you that I'm done. I'm just, sure. I'm just had it, you know? Sure. So it's it's a matter of time, place, and manner and what's going to work and what's not. And like anyway, I, I feel an obligation. And the question is when I uh, heed the call to that obligation. And that can be as simple as whether I'm, uh, you know, brave enough to do it or whether I'm too tired or embarrassed or whatever it is. And my manner of doing it may tend to be not reflect perfectly on me. It may be more throwing elbows than, attempting a, you know, a, a, a kind lecture or that sort of thing. But I think it depends on the people. I try to get involved in the dialogue and I try to push the idea that in, in my area, when I'm talking about free speech, um, I'm not going to be neutral about what I think about the speech that's protected. I'm not going to refrain from when talking about something that a proud boy said um, I'm not going to say it's clearly protected. Uh, I'm going to say this is bigoted bullshit uh, and exactly what you think from a guy in a club that you get into by getting punched while you say breakfast cereal names, but it's protected. Um, but do better. A, a proud boy or a neo-Nazi in a free speech case? Mm -hmm. Would I? Mm -hmm. In a free speech case? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think I would unless there was some element that made me unable to do it. If it were directed at someone I knew or, or something like that that prevented me from being an effective um, advocate. Um, that said, um, they might not want me uh, because, again, I'm not going to I'm not going to be the one who I'm not going to be the lawyer who says that these are actually fine young men. Uh, I'm going to be the lawyer who says that this is offensive to a lot of people, but it's still protected. And there are certainly going to be some people probably who will say something that's just so despicable. It's not that I think that um, it should be defended. It's not that I'm going to have anything whatsoever against the person who steps up and defends it. I'm going to admire that person. It just may not be me because I don't think I'll be effective. Right. I mean, I, it's, you know, it's like people have said to me before, you know, you represent people who are accused of killing people. You know, young yeah. people, um, we represent a number of 
people accused of sex crimes. Sure. Against children. You know, it's that's a, the job. Yeah, that's the job, and we do it right. And it doesn't mean that we like it. We actually right. think it's real bad to do those things. You know, those are not yes. right. We're not going around being like, "Hey, everybody, you should just totally go out and commit sex crimes and murder." But I, 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 th I, I think the sentiment is same: is that we absolutely can't trust society to just throw people in jail without a vigorous defense first. Uh, because we're a, a bunch of idiots and we'd never get the right people. Uh, we still don't get the right people, but at least we make it a little better when we have people like you standing in the way and making sure that you really have to work at it to put someone in jail. You have to have some sort of process. It's probably the same with free speech. Uh, you, you protect, you police the boundaries and you stand for the free, uh, free speech of awful people because not doing it creates precedent that will, in a heartbeat, be used by some cynical Republican against Black Lives Matter or Antifa or whatever. So, right. you know. Yeah, they just, they want to make us even sadder than we already are in this country. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Being, you know, and you, but to be honest, it's very, it's very hard to keep having to hold up what this country stands for. Right. Back to the Constitution when you don't feel that the country stands for you. And so a lot right. of, I think, backlash or a lot of what you hear you know, and it's different when you go out in the world, right? The world is different <clears throat> from social media. Very. Right? You go to the grocery store and it's not like Twitter. Like everybody's just human, except if we're not wearing masks, in which case. <laughs> but it's a very, it's a very different environment. It is. It is. When you're not out there, uh, in there. But we spend a lot of time in there. Too much, arguably. Why? Um, well, because, I mean, it's, it's not terribly psychologically healthy. It's not <laughs> really the best humanity has to offer. It's fun, but often fun for bad reasons. I mean, it can be completely informative. I can learn stuff that I wouldn't learn otherwise. I can be exposed to people um, that otherwise I wouldn't be exposed to. And, you know, meet people you'd never meet. And... Uh, I, I think it can be helpful in some good ways, like coming to see people that you otherwise wouldn't encounter as real people and understanding their, and stop seeing them sort of like stereotypes. Like just to, just to give an example, um, I, you know, like anyone else at one point, I might've described a politician as a whore, right? Someone who just, you know, uh, right, will right. say anything for money, right? Right. And I've, I've done that in the past um, mm -hmm. or refer to a, uh, to a politician right. prostit prostituting himself. But on social media, in, in talking about free speech and over-policing and how police treat people badly, I met and talked to and got to know a number of sex workers. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they're real live people, just like you and me, right? And I, all of a sudden, I felt when I was going to break out this – politician is such a whore. I'm like, why am I using that epithet for the politician when I know people who are sex workers who uh, I don't want to use, you know, I don't want to use it that way. Thank you right. so much. I took up a lot of your... It was my pleasure. You know, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to watching more of this show because uh, I, I have to say that I, um, I admire how much you tell it like it is about the system and your part in it and what you see and that you're not afraid to call out and disagree with people for one of a better term on your side uh, on the criminal justice defense side and point out that there are i mean that there's sort of um things you're not supposed to say even among criminal defense attorneys there are there are uh sacred cows uh, among them as much as among anyone and i really like your willingness to call that stuff out and to call it like you see it well, I hope you liked our two part. Well, I hope you like our. <laughs> well, I hope you like. What? What is English even? Well, I hope you liked our two part interview with Ken White. If you did, please subscribe to this channel so you'll be told. Please subscribe to the channel so that you'll know. Nope. That's not right. Please subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification so that you'll know whenever we get a new video up. And please hit the like button because the YouTube algorithm likes to know what you like. Thanks, bye.